the first plenary session after the opening speeches is always important because it sets the stage for what we're going to be doing for the next day, and two days actually. Um, so this uh, theme of client centricity we know is very important in terms of driving financial inclusion and moving towards you know, universal financial access in 2020. The issue, we've made progress, as Anne mentioned in her speech, there's been a lot of progress since 2013, certainly over the last few years. The question is, can we make more progress? And this opening plenary session is designed to take stock of where we are in the uh, movement towards greater financial inclusion and using client centricity to, to achieve that, but also to look ahead a bit where we're going in the next few years. So we have a very distinguished panel that has been put together by my colleague on the financial inclusion team. Samaya Sajad is a program manager, manages several of the partnerships with you in this room, and I'm going to invite her up to the stage now with her panel. So please welcome Samaya Sajad and the panel. Come on up. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back from the coffee break. So Roger announced this as the first plenary session but you know, we're not even a quarter of our way into the agenda, but I feel the energy in the room, I felt the energy in the coffee break, that sense of being inspired. And, and why not? I mean, this morning we heard from Juliet Anima about Jumia Nigeria, a company that had we gathered together some five, 10 years back, we might not have envisioned to be running in Africa in 23 countries the way that it is. It's, it's really exciting, uh, it's really exciting stuff. It's, fundamentally shifting how customers are making purchases. And, and why is that important? Because when you can make one aspect of life go better, then the energy or the effort that you plugged into that aspect can be redirected towards the many other daily challenges that you face. And that really is, is that essence of client centricity. And that's, that's what we're talking about in this room. And that's why we have the Jumias of the world with us at Sophie. Anne Miles, in her opening remarks, also reminded us of that same, same point, that there are remarkable shifts in, in the environment in which we work in. The kinds of organizations that we work in is, is vastly different today than it was five years back or 10 years back. And the customers that we cater our products and services to, their expectations uh, are also much higher. But, but this is all, we should all take this in a positive way. What this means is that each one of us, whether we are an MFI, a commercial bank, uh, a mobile network operator, or a Jumia, or an agribusiness, each one of us need to embark on our very personal journeys towards customer centricity. Because again, as Anne said, transformation is critical. We all need to transform. And this year, over the course of the next two days, we're gonna talk about transformation at many levels. This particular panel is gonna focus on transformation at the institutional level, but by the time we end today, we'll be talking about what happens if the ecosystem at the market level looks different, that kind of transformation. And then tomorrow we start to talk about, well, what's the impact of these transformed institutions working in a transformed ecosystem? So before I explain my panel any further, I wanna do a quick exercise. You all have caffeine in yourself, so you should be able to cooperate with myself. Can I, can I ask all of you to please stand up for a moment? Okay, so obviously you're all the Sophie 2017 participants. Just look around for two, three seconds. I hope that you see some familiar faces because it's always nice to run into friends. But more importantly, I hope you see faces that you don't know. Uh, you know, this is, this is a point that Roger made earlier, our family is growing. So find those faces you don't know, those organizations you know nothing about. These are the people you need to be friends with by the end of the week, yeah? Okay, so, and now remain standing if you were with us in Kigali last year at Sophie 2016. Okay, so fewer people standing. Thank you for coming back. <laughs> Sophie 2015 was held in Cape Town, South Africa. If you were with us there, can you stand? Some of you might have sat down, but okay. So I hope you're taking note of what's happening, yeah? Sophie 2014 in Italy, gelato and espresso. It's, it's uh, there are fewer people standing. 2013 also in Italy. 
You know, you know, I have all the names, so I can call them out. I have the full list. But I see a corner over there, and I know there are more people, but a round of applause for, for the friends and colleagues over there. But, you know, beyond applause, the point that I wanted to create is that we talk about this evolving ecosystem, we talk about new stakeholders, but rarely do we try to visualize it, right? And I hope this exercise gave you that sense of actual people in this room. We try really hard at the foundation to ensure that those new faces are represented here. And what new faces really mean is that when we talk about client centricity, how we define it, why we think it's important to be client centric, how do we become client centric, these things, people might be thinking about them differently. They might have different approaches in mind, different models. And so we're gonna be talking about this topic for the next two days, and we are a space or an industry you know, known for our jargon. I won't be able to solve our jargon crisis, but at the very le least, I will get us on the same page in terms of what we mean by this central term that we're using. Um, so I have 75 minutes, I'm gonna spend a chunk of my time bringing us all on the same pace. We're gonna do something like a crash course on client centricity. Then, then, I, then I bring two providers who've been part of the Sophie journey in the past to tell us where they are today. You know, let's do a status update with them. You know, you promised us X. Are you at a place that's better than X today? Or, and what have you learned along the way? And then let's start pushing the envelope, looking into the future. We've, uh, we've talked about some really big goals and big dreams uh, for this room here. How do we start moving towards those goals and dreams? So that's, that's a lay of the land, and I have 75 minutes to do that. But for that first chunk, you know, that crash course on client centricity, I'm really excited to welcome to the stage Herod Kutsia from CGAP. Many of you have seen Herod at Sophie over the last few years. He's one of a handful of people who've attended all five events, and, and it's just so nice to have him part of this conversation. Herod heads up the the customers and the provider solutions team at CGAP, where with a bigger team, he works with a set of financial service providers to really implement the many concepts and approaches that we've talked about over the last few years. And so in this very evidence-driven way, he's come up with definitions and frameworks and tools that'll help this room, and more than half this room are providers, really take the concepts back home. So Harrod, you have 10 minutes. Give us the what, why, and, uh, and the how. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be here again. I said to, um, and it feels like a reunion. Uh, I don't want to say high school reunion because you all look too old, but, um, <laughs> but it feels like a reunion, right? Now that I've insulted the audience and I have your intention, attention, let me go on. Uh, I, I did want to say it was interesting to observe this standing up and sitting down. Some people were standing up and sitting down and standing up and sitting down and then confused <laughs> to Maya, so there was no count. I was thinking about 2013. In 2013, we did not even define customer centricity that year. It is as if we arrived in Turin and we decided that we're going to put the customer at the center and that's what we're going to do, and we did it quite well. So that symposia sort of said, here's the topic, that's where we are going. End of 2014, people ask, so what is this definition of customer centricity? And we looked at each other and said, well, we better start using a definition because people are gonna ask us again the year after. And we looked around and we thought, well, customer centricity is not about just smiling and customer care and being friendly and working with poor people. It is much more than that. So we start using this definition as by Doug Leather in a book called The Customer Centricity Blueprint. And it basically says, customer centricity is a business model that operates in the firm's ecosystem. Suddenly, you're looking at a whole systemic approach, or systems approach. And that ecosystem consists of customers, employees, suppliers, shareholders, uh, and the communities it serves. Part of that are also the partners that you work with. And suddenly when you start arguing that, you're thinking far more thorough, far more comprehensive, and far more about the many places things can go wrong if you don't have your eye on the customer. And how do we measure our achievement around customer centricity? Well, we'll come back to that several times. 
during today's discussion. But the one way of looking at it is whether you created value for the customer, value for the firm, and let's hope value for society as well. So what drives the adoption of customer-centric models? Well, mostly shocks, mostly challenges that we have to look at and we have to face as financial institutions. And the, the reality of these challenges are that these challenges are derived from how customers perceive your services, whether you are eroding customer trust, whether they have a good or a bad experience. And um, this leads to non-take up, low use, dormancy, dropouts, and uh, we know that as a sector or an industry, whatever we want to call ourselves, we are not doing so well in terms of that use part, which is something that we have to attend to. It is not only shocks, it's also customers are more informed. Social media helps a lot with spreading the word. And we know that customers make financial decisions mostly on the basis of word of mouth. So uh, we have to be attuned to that as well. More customers demand value because they're better informed. It's a more competitive playing field, so we have to differentiate ourselves. And lastly, businesses are also looking for more sustainable business models, of which the customer-centric model is definitely one. How do you move to become? How do you adopt a customer-centric model? Well, it is probably an exceedingly difficult thing to do depending on where you are in your maturity as a firm. If you're a startup firm and you can instill that kind of behavior uh, right up, up front, it's probably easier. If you are a sort of a firm that's quite mature and you've worked on a different model, that's quite a challenge. But they say there are three shifts that are of importance when you want to be more customer-centric as a firm. Firstly, is the culture. And as leaders, and you are the leaders in the room, you are responsible for that culture. Secondly, it is about strategy. Oh, sorry, strategy first. Um, and the strategy is based on you as a leader focusing on that culture. Secondly, culture, where the culture is changing from product-driven culture to a culture of solving customer problems. And then lastly, structure follows. I must tell you this is the first time in many years that I'm using uh, notes <laughs> to speak. Uh, I, I, I know Jan, uh, Janina was quite surprised by that, but, but my general here is a strict <laughs> taskmaster. Right. So, um, so now that we've looked at uh, what is the definition of customer centricity, what is the the, uh, the drivers of customer centricity and the fact that it's difficult to uh, adopt this model. Let's look at our journey uh, at the symposium over the last four years plus this year. So at the bottom of the slide, you have the pillars of customer centricity, which we've synthesized from research across the globe in terms of firms that are doing well in this regard. And, um, and the first one, customer-centric leadership and culture, we've literally covered at every symposium from 2013 to 2016. The second one, customer-focused operations, we are a little bit sort of light on work in that area, although, although Nick Hughes, and today you will hear from John Ridley in COPA, has a lot to say about that. Um, and Nick share this with us in 2016, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, on empowering people with tools and insights, we've done a lot of work around tools and insights at uh, the symposium, but we have not addressed empowering people that much, except Leon Lawrence did it in 2014, when he spoke about empowering people and adding value for customers. And then, uh, customer experience, design and delivery at Every symposium, we had something about that. Uh, and lastly, customer value. We had a lot of mention of the business case, of creating customer value, but it is a nut that we must still crack, so to speak. 
Um, if we uh, uh, just can do a little bit of a commercial moment for about nine seconds, uh, this is the guide to customer centricity which uh, we put together to guide financial institutions in this adoption and application of the model. And tomorrow morning, I will take you quickly with a surprise guest helping me through the guide. Right. And you will find a little brochure like this on your table tomorrow morning, not now, creating some demand here and anticipation, uh, and we will, we will cover that. Um, and I will then look at this uh, more in terms of how we structured the, the guide. But what is extremely important of the guide is the guide guides financial service providers to face and solve, uh, well, to solve and identify four business challenges. Firstly, customer retention. I know nobody's got a problem with customer retention, so let me quickly go to acquisition. Big challenge, development of the customer in terms of more products for customer and largely use. I have two takeaways from what you just shared. When you had your second slide on, I just quickly counted the number of topics that we've covered over the last four years coming to the fifth. 23 topics. That doesn't make it seem like this journey towards client centricity is an easy job by any means. But my takeaway from you introducing the, the five pillars and the guide is that there's actually a way to be quite organized and, and a systematic journey towards client centricity. And so I hope that's, that's good news for all the providers who are sitting in the room. But the second piece, which probably comes before the first piece, is that you need to articulate what business challenge or challenges it is that you want to address. You know, do you want to acquire? Do you want to retain? Do you want to increase usage? you want to grow your customers, it's probably a combination or a sequencing, but keep that in mind. And that's actually a message that's come up several times at past events. I have uh, a question for you. This is a question that I'm relaying back from the audience to you. You've heard it, I've heard it, all of us ask each other this question. So you apply these methodologies, this design, research, et cetera, methodologies. Are there results? You know, where's the business case for this? And, and so I want you to share two to three of your most favorite or most compelling examples where these organizations have applied the principles and have experienced the benefits. Yeah, let me, um, let me turn to that. And I, um, I can say I anticipated this question and I'm prepared <laughs> for it. Okay, so, uh, so uh, um, the rule is, the, the first thing is that you, the 2% rule applies. 2% increase in retention saves you 10% in cost. That is international research. But what is even more fascinating is that if you turn to our industry and you look at results here, and my slide is somehow gone, um, we uh, looked at three firms, just as an example. The first firm, MetLife. The message in MetLife, and I'm not talking about MetLife in America, I'm talking about MetLife in emerging countries, is product simplification based on needs. Product simplification based on needs, and, uh, and MetLife uh, had very good results on the basis of that compared to competitors. Digital Haiti, the message there is product simplification focus on the product customer really needs, and use community structures in training customers to reinforce product functionality training. And there they moved from 40,000 to over 800,000 active mobile customers between 2015 and 2017. And then lastly, I want to, to finish with PEP. Um, the reality of PEP was product simplification and customer value, and then train and, 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 and inculcate the culture of customer service with your employees, empower them to do it. And in the final analysis, value for customers is the leverage point. Mm -hmm. When customers trust financial service providers to solve real life challenges and dissolve pain points for them, this equates to realized customer value. And I want to stop there. Thanks very much. 
I want to bring back two organizations who've shared these stories with us over the last four years. They committed to certain things, or they shared their goals with us. They shared what they're going to do over the next few years. And it's been a few years now, and I'm going to ask them, you know, where things are with them. So I'm really excited to have with us Denis Moniot from Microcred and John Ridley from MCOPA Labs. I'm going to give a little bit of background, and I'm going to remind all of you what, what their colleagues had shared with us in past years. So Denis and John, welcome. Thank you. So Denis here is the Chief Innovation Officer at Microcred and the Chief Technology Officer. He works with Microcred's banks in Africa and China to apply technology and apply digital to, to transform how they do financial services. And he's, he's had a career where he's focused on this, you know, how, how can technology advance uh, financial services and make it better for customers. And he's back here because some of you will remember, those of you who stood up when I asked if you were with us in 2015, Mark Flaming, who was then the Chief Operations Officer, had said, look, we want to grow our business in Senegal and Madagascar, and the only way we can do it is if we adopt a mass market strategy. And a mass market strategy has to be driven by client centricity, which for us has a number and a face. And then he said, what we have done now is laid the train tracks, and we've invested a lot of money to do it, and over the next few years, we're going to build the cars to run on these tracks. So I'm going to ask you, Deneen, a little bit, what are those cars, and what's been the process behind that? John is uh, the director of MCOPA Labs. MCOPA Labs is that cool unit within MCOPA where new solutions for customers are envisioned. What is that next problem for clients that MCOPA can address? He's thinking about things around agriculture or education, and we'll get a little bit of a sneak peek into what might come next for, for MCOPA. And, and prior to MCOPA, John spent a lot of time in this world of innovation and startups, so, so we're gonna have two different kinds of provider conversations, but I'll try my best to bring up some of the common themes. And John, uh, a little bit of background on what his colleagues had shared with us in the past. Jesse Moore was part of this event a few years back, and he said, we're only interested in solving a billion dollar problem, and energy for them was the one that they identified. Nick, uh, Herod, you referred to him last year. He was here, and we had invited him to talk about data. So he spent a good 20 minutes talking about data, and right before the end of his talk, he said, yeah, we're known about data, we know how to use our data, we know how to mobilize our data, analyze it, all of that, but 80% of our success is real boots on the ground, hard operations work. So John, I'm gonna ask you questions on that. And, and so keep that in mind, keep that background in mind, and as they give you the update, think about questions or um, ideas or thoughts uh, on that sort of timeline. Let's start by, um, by understanding your business models. Um, we know of what they were a few years back, and they've evolved over time because you as organizations have transformed in different capacities. Um, give us a sense of where you started and where you are today. Dini, I'm gonna start with you. That mass market strategy, can you, can you remind us what it is and what's at the crux of it and, and that sort of defining business model? Yeah, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so, I think we've been there doing this business for, for 10 years in a very um, analog fashion. And um, our story is really uh, the one of a transformation. Um, for us, digital and customer centricity is, is two sides of the same thing. And that thing is to go, um, to go mass market to be relevant to much more clients. So we basically try to find how we can become relevant to everybody every day in a digital and therefore scalable way. Um, so, so this is what, we, what we're trying to achieve, and we're basically trying to, to plug a new business line into uh, our current uh, uh, business model, a business line that would be um, high volume, low margin, fully scalable, fully digital um, uh, business line. So we, we have, um, through that transformation journey, we're going through four waves. Um, the first one is basically to, to set up the technology, to put everything in place so that all other digital things are made possible. Um, so that's a lot of work. This is a lot of years also spent. This is not always some, the, this is definitely not the, top of, the tip of the iceberg, but this is a, um, things like uh, putting uh, centralized IT, IT infrastructure in place, a single code-based core banking system for 10 countries in Africa, 
this is centralized data warehouse, this is a, a number of things like that that puts it in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where digital transformation is then only just possible. The second wave is, uh, is basically creating an end-to-end -end, um, digital experience for the client. So we go through the entire customer journey and we say, okay, this step, how can we move it from analog to digital? And we do that for every single step of our customer journey, for loans, onboarding, loans, savings, everything. Um, the third one is, is basically to say, we also have a core business that is there that is actually um, taking care of already many clients. It's, it's what the company has been since inception. And this has to benefit also this digital transformation. So the third wave is basically to say, once we have digitalized one uh, in view of going to a mass market uh, business line, once we have digitalized and improved one step of the customer journey, we also make it our core business benefit of it. So if we invent an app uh, that, that will be used by our mass market customer, we make sure that we can also make it useful for our core business. And the fourth one is basically say when all of these things are being done, you still need to get the clients. And the fourth one is basically um, acceleration, it's basically uh, acceleration of adoption of new clients, of usage, and, and, and leveraging more things like digital marketing, social media, so that we make sure that we have also, we are scalable also on the, on the growth of the customers. And so now, where are we? We are basically uh, finishing wave two and three, so building the full digital uh, customer journey. And, and starting the number four, acquiring the customers. Oh, thank you. I'll ask you more about the waves and how you've been riding them. Uh, I think you, I know you have some interesting updates on that front. John, I, I, I have a similar question for you. Can you describe MCOPA's business to us? We know MCOPA, we've heard from MCOPA, but you've scaled tremendously. Every time we talk with you, there are more numbers to share. So, um, you know, where are you today? Okay, yeah, thank you. Well. Um, you know, Jesse Moore is an entrepreneur and setting a, a big target is his, is his job. <clears throat> I, I mean, I think the, we've, in the last two years since he was here, we've experienced 100% growth, which is we're nudging on 600,000 customers. Uh, very exciting. Um, but it made me qualify what he said by saying energy is a starting point <clears throat> in, in terms of the financial services that we're looking to um, provide to customers. Uh, if, I'm sure a lot of people know MCOPA, but some won't. The M in the name it stands for mobile, and COPA essentially is uh, Swahili for borrow. So it's mobile borrowing, and our catchphrase or motto is Mandaleo ni Leo, which essentially means helping customers to upgrade their or improve their lives. So we're all about providing flexible access to credit to help customers. Um, to develop the credit relationship, we have to develop a, we have to sell a product. That's our starting point. We don't need with credit. And energy there is, is the starting point. Everyone will know that um, there's hundreds of millions of people in sub-Saharan Africa who live off grid, dependent on a dirty and expensive fuel kerosene that is expensive to access and it has all sorts of hazards. So uh, MCOPA's <clears throat> core product is a solar home system which has an embedded uh, SIM card we allow customers to put a small deposit down and take the system home, and then they pay us back using mobile money in small increments every day until they've, they've paid off the device. Um, so that's flexible mobile lending. Um, the thing I'd say about customer centricity, <clears throat> excuse me, is when you're, when you're offering credit on that basis, the customer is everything. Uh, customers can just walk away and not, not repay, and we're left with bad debt. So all of, the, all of our product uh, positioning um, and service offering has to really meet customers' needs and help them with their lives, otherwise we, essentially we don't have a business. Maybe over time though, the, the business model has evolved beyond that as you get customers onto the account. So, but I thought I'd just talk through the stages of the process that we have in terms of achieving our lifetime value uh, with customers. Um, the first one which uh, really refers to the earlier discussion is about attracting. Um, so we have to find a, a problem um, and that's not an easy sell in many ways. So we talk about problem-based selling at the first sale. It's face-to-face -face sale. We have about um, 1,500 sales representatives out in the field who on a daily basis are engaging with customers. 
walking them through the challenges they face in terms of their current option for energy, looking at the costs of an alternative, cleaner solution, um, and then helping them make the decision to adopt our product. And that's where technology really does have to, have to support that transaction because I've been with sales agents out in the customers' houses. They spend a long time working with a customer to do the sums, help them recognize the savings, the long-term benefits, and so on. And then if the network is down and you can't transact the activation process, it's frustrating for the customer, for the customer and for the agent. So it's an intensive process, the upfront um, um, attraction. Then we're really into the process of retaining the customer. We've extended credit that sits on our balance sheet. We want the money back, right? So we need the customers that have to love the product, they have to get the, the support they need. We have a very large customer support team they have to like the repayments. There has to be flexibility. We don't just cut people off if they run into difficulty with payment. Um, and we then also start to offer them uh, options for add-on products once they start to reach the end of their payment process. Uh, we're, what's very popular, for example, is a fuel-efficient charcoal stove. Uh, it's another product that can help people save money, uh, small increments, and that can be done remotely. And really where we're trying to get to in terms of customer lifetime value is upgrade. So that's the next product beyond basic power. Televisions, for example, are extremely popular. We've sold about 80,000 TV so far. Um, and that's a, a good use uh, for customers with the savings that they're making on kerosene on a product. So it's really having the systems and processes and the right staff uh, to help customers through that whole process, whether it's face-to-face -face or remotely. Thank you, thank you for that. What I'm trying to connect it back to, uh, to Herod, what you laid out for us. The, the common theme I'm seeing here is that both, uh, both Microcred and MCOPA, obviously, like many of you in this room, are trying to grow your customer base. So you have this continuous acquisition cycle that's going on, but while you're doing this, simultaneously, you're trying to do more with your existing customers, and you have all of this back office and technology and operations work that's, that's evolving in order to facilitate that acquisition growth and, and retention, uh, th those challenges that, that Harrod, you mentioned. So I, I'm, I'm gonna dig a little bit further, Microcred, uh, Dini, with you about Microcred. So you lay out these core technology blocks that you refer to, the, the first wave of the four waves. Can you give us a, a more real example of designing and launching a product that'll run on those rails, a product with a new digital face for customers. Yeah, so um, I'll, take a, I'll take one example The I think is, is, has been very interesting. We, we have um, uh, designed a new product we call uh, Taka, it's the name of the product. Um, so basically where it starts is we start by, of course, researching um, one specific need of the client or one pain point. And so we, for this one, we pick the uh, the need for urgent and discrete access to uh, liquidity. So then from there, we, we keep in mind what we, what's important to us. So what, like I said before, it has to be digital, it has to be um, scalable, it has to benefit both our mass market strategy as well as being reusable in our core business. So we basically keep that in mind and we start designing the product. So we, of course, we meet the clients a lot, we show them concepts, we, uh, we, we design the, the product, we prototype it before we build it, and then we build it, we pilot it, and off we go, we start scaling it. So um, Taka alone is basically um, quite simple. It's, uh, you, take, um, you take from the, it's, it's, of course, the decision making is, is scoring, so there is no human uh, decision involved. You take um, uh, the loan directly from the agent network, so you don't have to come to the branch. Uh, and and the part, one thing that is um, important is the flexibility in the repayment that we gave it. So if you take 100 today as the loan, um, you will have to repay 106. And that doesn't matter whether you repay in two days or in three months. From, from two days to three months, it's exactly the same amount to repay. And that is the full flexibility that the customers have liked so much because they basically are able to... Um, as they are relieved from the uncertainty of how much am I going to repay, is it worth still keeping the money or not, etc. So of course we give them incentive they repay early, because otherwise nobody would repay before the, the three months. But, and, and it works very well, people are, 
basically uh, very happy with the product. And, and the, 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 so the key takeaways I, I want to highlight here, uh, the, the first one is this concept of under design. And I think this is something that is really, really important in the way we design our products. Um, we, we, we view every single product feature as a potential friction. So basically what we try to say is, okay, is this idea, this feature really important or can we do without it? And, and we try to under design the product. And the, the goal of that is to let the clients actually show us the way on the way they want to use the product. So we make it very simple and we've observed behavior of people using the product in very different ways. Some of them really like we thought to just take an emergency, an emergency was arising, they were taking the loan and that's it. Some others were rather to manage the peaks in their working capital needs um, and, and many, many different ways. So everybody sort of self serve the, the, what he wants from the product. And, uh, and, and this is giving us um, for the future a lot of ideas on what to do. We could now make it better, you know, split the product in two, make it better for some usage and some others. So under design for us is very important. Another aspect in this process of building the product is this, this, this thing of digital versus human relationship. For, for a long time, our relationship with our customers has been extremely human, extremely human. So it's actually more than a relationship between microcode and its client, it's been a relationship between portfolio managers and their clients. So when we launch this digital product, we make people eligible, we send them an SMS for the offer. Uh, and it's returned, congratulations, you are eligible for this amount, for this loan, any information you need, call center number. What happens is all clients call their portfolio managers, never the call center. And they, won't say, they say, I've received this SMS, what is it, should I take it, is it, is it real, is it good for me? Um, so, this, is a, this has been an issue for us because uh, uh, obviously this is uh, um, reducing the scalability of the product. We now have to train all the commercial officer who's going to be called. Um, so it's a challenge that we have to look at. And the, the last thing I want to highlight is, is um, internal buy-in. You remember my different waves. So wave number three is make our digital product also useful for our core business. For that, they, they need to to buy in to the product, right? And it's hard for an institution where portfolio managers and credit committee have made, the, have made all the decisions on lending for the last 10 years to tell them right now, there's now a, an algorithm that runs somewhere in the cloud that's gonna take the decisions for you. So what we introduce is a functionality that we call opt-out that basically allows the portfolio manager to say, oh, this client and this client, I take them off the scoring and they will never be eligible. And we did that not because we think it's gonna be good for the risk we take. We did that just because we thought that if we do that, our staff will have the feeling that they have their still something to do about the product and they, it's, it's, they might avoid one or two very um, fraudsters to take the loan uh, that, that the scoring might not have seen. That doesn't matter so much, but they will really think, you know, we controlling this and we are able to. So, so it's this, this idea of giving them um, yeah, the, the possibility to act on these products as well. Thank you, Denis. Um, I really liked how you described the product, the product development process. It's really like you developed it with the client and not so much you know, sitting in your office and prototyping by yourselves. It was engaging the customers, not, not perhaps explicitly, but letting them use it and then find out what the patterns of usage are and then determining you know, where this product fits in within their, their broader portfolios. And then on your point uh, on sort of aligning with core business at the foundation, we have a portfolio of work in what we call alternative delivery channels and one of the things that we've learned is that as you launch these channels you know you've been doing business a certain way for 10 20 years and now you're introducing a digital piece that whole analog to digital journey that you mentioned how do you keep how do you ensure that from the outside you still maintain a reputation that seamless you know microcred is known to be an organization that you go to for x or y right because what's happening in the back office is, is happening in the back office customer experience needs to be seamless, or, or you try to keep it seamless like that. John, I'm going to come back to you now. I want to, so this is when we're going to go into Nick's comment on this, this boots of the ground piece, and a lot of what you said earlier, it seems to me that face-to-face, -face, that human transaction at that sales point, or that point when you're acquiring new customers remains critical. 
So as you grow, and we have the chart up with the numbers, this tremendous growth that you've had, how do you, how do you continue to have that, that feature, but also develop an operating model that is, that is efficient and, and more process-led, perhaps? It's a great, <clears throat> great question, um, and, I, and I think it's about the process of continual improvement. Um, I, I would say experimentation, but I hope it's more deliberate than that in a way. Uh, I mean, what we do hasn't necessarily changed. I guess it's, it's the how, how we do it. We, we seem to have leveled out in terms of full-time staff and uh, sales staff in the market. And I, I liked Anne's reminder that we have to be nimble. But also, I think increasingly, um, as you get to a certain scale, you have to look for certain efficiency. Um, and so, you know, what's the right ratio of sales staff to sales managers? Uh, and, and, and I guess the thing that's changed, I've seen or the development has been, MCOP has always had a rich data feed, but increasingly becomes data informed, if you like. So if you go to a stand-up meeting at any level, whether it's in one of the shops or at HQ, you'll, you'll see these data feeds coming in. And if something's happening on repayments, uh, there'll be immediate uh, contact with customers to understand is something impeding them? Is it a systems problem? Is it part of the pricing policy? So, um, and, and that will, that will um, help us, those, those data feeds, for example, we know that just absolute numbers of sales staff in the market doesn't lead to happy customers or numbers of sales. It's touch points with customers, numbers of touch points, and if you like, successful touch points with customers. So, <clears throat> and we can now, um, on a daily basis, measure the, the extent to which our sales team are out there um, and some of that is technology. Uh, we do have sales apps that we're equipping our staff with. Um, and for example, on a Monday morning, a video will go out from head of sales, telling everybody about the new offers, um, reminders about customer preferences and so on. And actually some of our customers have tried to download and download and use that themselves. That's not its intention, but you know, that's an interesting opportunity, isn't it? Um, uh, but we, I guess uh, the other thing about like, maybe, let's call it maturing, the organization becomes increasingly specialized as a sort of young entrepreneurial startup. Everyone was involved in everything. Now teams are pretty much super zoomed in on you know, the credit team, focus on credit. If we want to know is the election having an impact or har harvest has failed somewhere, the credit team will be able to give those data. Um, and, and that's, that, that, if you like, that increasing specialization whilst understanding the context of customers is, is really important. And I think the other thing that maybe changes over time, and Jumia, I think some colleagues have been speaking to Jumia and Kenya about um, partnering partnership becomes important because we can't do everything. We can't develop all the products. We can't distribute all of the products. Um, <clears throat> and we can't satisfy all of the, the customer needs. So um, we've, we've kind of been fully integrated in many ways because we've had to, but. Um, <clears throat> serving customers' needs as they expand beyond energy alone. Um, more use of credit um, depends on partnership to a large extent, I think. So I want to go into that point, going beyond energy, and mm. I want to go deeper into what you're representing, mm. MCOPA Labs. So you, in an earlier conversation, you mentioned that you feel MCOPA is only scratching the surface in terms mm. of what it can do to meet customer, uh, customer pain points. So uh, what, is, what is the philosophy behind the product expansion, the product suite expansion? You know, can you, and, and I promise the audience a sneak peek into what we might see from MCOPA. So how do you decide where to go next? Because you have this operating model, model that's been established over the last few years. How do you decide what to provide and, um, and then tell us what we might see? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I guess I'm trying to be really sensible, but part of my job is to be a little bit irresponsible and, and think, uh, try and think a bit further out. The, the challenge in an uh, organization like MCOPA is it, innovation is, is built into the DNA. It's set up by three entrepreneurs. Um, but the core business as it grows has to have this focus and stay really uh, keep a granular attention to customers needs sales and so on so the challenge or the danger with a growing organization that's really focused on the now is you don't have enough uh, time and resource frankly to worry about the future mm -hmm. so labs uh, Nick uh, who's the chief product officer one of the founders was particularly concerned that we we, we do both um, so labs is a, a smallish ring fence resource to uh, create a buffer between the day-to-day -day pressures of, of sales and looking after customers 
and anyone in Nairobi who, who's, who's good, and there's a lot of good people, get focused on, can you help us solve this problem? Just a bit of buffer between that and thinking about, well, what will our customers want in two years? If they have paid off their lights and they have a TV, what else might they want related to power? Uh, or if they have this credit relationship with us and they're involved in farming, can we satisfy that need and how do we do that? How can we play a role with credit and knowledge of our customer and, and, and facilitate distribution of, of agricultural inputs that they need or just credit that they can then choose themselves? And, and so our role is really to um, experiment sensibly within uh, strategic areas that are defined by our board, recognizing there's a whole range of opportunities out there. Um, we have to see that point at which we join up again. And it can't be five years out because Jesse doesn't have patience for that. So next year would be good, but, um, but <clears throat> the, so we do have some products coming out to market next year related to power in the home and small enterprise. Uh, we're trying to achieve that same theme of uh, material benefit to customers in terms of economic savings. Um, it's hard to find a, a, a similar opportunity to kerosene. You can displace kerosene overnight. There's a saving. When it comes to other um, either household or small enterprise opportunities, it's more about efficiency of expenditure, um, labor time, or time that could be invested into labor and so on. So I guess some of the products that we're working on will be a little bit more risky, but we think there's huge opportunities, particularly for, for women, frankly, who bear a lot of the, the, the labor, or the, if you like, the opportunity cost of being really tied to some of the chores. Um, and, and then we're looking at uh, a whole range of credit products, um, ag credit we're, we're pushing quite hard on, um, but we ha haven't actually found the perfect solution there. And I think more partnerships and actually more use of technology to overcome this payment um, cycle between customers, us, and these providers. Um, my, my, my chief financial officer doesn't want to see a large uh, cost for inventory uh, on my tab. Um, so we have to have partners who will have that sort of specialism. And then we sell a lot of smartphones. We have screens in people's houses. So content connectivity, affordable connectivity, and then uh, valued or valuable services, whether that's content, information, or actually entertainment, uh, that we can layer over that are some of the key areas that we're working on. Is that enough of a sneak peek? That's, that's enough of a sneak peek, but I'm sure you're going to get many questions in the hallway. So be, be prepared for that. And there are especially, I know, I know there's a lot of people from the rural and ag finance space, so, so be prepared for that. And I wish we had time to jump into that. But I also, I just want to uh, repeat one thing you said, that careful experimentation. I hear it as, you know, this appetite for uh, measured failure. You know, we, we talk about how do you build a culture that allows some small, small mistakes to happen from which you can learn, you know? Yep. So I, I heard that a little bit from you. I have a final question for, for both of you, which is around how, how do you define success? So within your four waves of mass market strategy, what does success look like for you, Denis? Um, <clears throat> the obvious number of uh, loan, VAC loans disbursed, uh, um, uh, the revenue, uh, um, the usage, uh, just also sometimes you, you can uh, start measuring success when you go onto the field and you have some qualitative feedback. I remember someone who, um, who a client who I've been introduced to as the person who led the team who invented the TAC alone, and then the guy said, but you, it was in Senegal we introduced, and the guy said, but you're not Senegalese. He was shocked, and I said, no, I'm not Senegalese, but how can you, are you reading in people's mind then? Because this is exactly the kind of product we wanted to use, and like, this is the qualitative feedback. But overall, the big picture, what really matters for us is to, uh, to be able to, to, to see that the customer is moving from a, a transactional-based relationship with us, meaning you take a loan today for 12 installments, and every month you will pay an installment, and that's how you perceive us as the thing you visit once a month for paying an installment, moving away from that to a, a solution-driven relationship where basically the customer would come back to us anytime he has something um, that, that is around the solutions that we propose and that he thinks about us as, as a solution uh, more than just uh, what is the next transaction I have to do with him. If we make that a success, then it will be good.
That's that's a really good picture of what success looks like. John, the same question, like uh, for you, you know, what does success look like at Encopa? Yeah, sure. Well, I'll split it into those three areas: attract, retrain, and upgrade. Attract, uh, of course, we're selling 500 uh, systems a day. We want to be higher than that. Um, retain repayments is an indicator of the extent to which customers like the product, the pricing, and that, the flexibility and the support. So we're in, in excess of 95%. We want higher than that. Net promoter score, as we, we call it, would someone recommend in excess of 97%? And then the upgrade, which is really the new part of the whole thing, is we're, we're I, I think we're heading for 60% of paid off customers upgrading to uh, another product, um, and then beyond that, uh, as far as we can go. And uh, if I was Jesse, I'd say a million customers by the next time we see you is that time. Hopefully, fingers crossed. So, uh, we, you know, we could spend a lot more time here, but we're, we're running a little bit out of time. If I, I want to draw maybe one takeaway from listening to Denis and John is that both both Microcred and, and Copa spent a consider, considerable amount of time and resource resources figuring out the foundations. In the case of Microcred, it was those technology rails, that first wave. If that is not strongly laid out, then what you do afterwards is just not going to be, not going to work as well as it is now, the Taka Loan product. In the case of MCOPA, that operating model that took a little bit of iteration to get to, and now that you have that in place, you can start thinking about those ag products. So, so let's keep that in mind as we have further, further conversations here over the course of the next uh, couple of days. I'm going to move on to that final final chunk of my panel, which I mentioned earlier, which is looking into the future. You know, how can this conversation? How do we work together to advance our our goals around financial inclusion? Um, and talk to us about really big goals. She said, um, client centricity in our sector can mean gateway to a better life. I want to understand what better life means. And so there's, there's a reason there's a fifth chair on the podium. Daryl Collins, Anne already mentioned her. She was a big inspiration behind this whole client centricity theme. Daryl is managing director at BFA. Um, and we really know her for someone for her financial diaries work, but also just the extensive amount of time she has spent to get to know customers and, and their financial behaviors. And a little bit of history, because I gave history for Microcred and Mcopa, and Daryl was part of her first symposium in a panel where the question was, what do clients want from financial service providers? What do they want from their FSPs? And, and we're still asking ourselves that question. And then she came back and talked to us also about research methodologies. But one message that she's always been giving us is, is focus. You can segment down right to that last customer, but there are market level livelihood patterns. Keep an eye on that and that'll help you design what it is that you want to design. And the other thing she said is you can research until the cows come home. You know, we're, <laughs> but uh, if you don't know what business challenge it is that you want to address, this is, this is not a very productive way of doing business. So, Daryl, my first question to you uh, today is the first question we asked you in 2013, but I'm gonna drop a letter. What do customers want, not from FSPs, but what do customers want from FS, from financial services? So, I think that we all know in this room that customers don't really want an account, and they don't necessarily want a wallet. They want the things that that will bring them, right? They want a better roof on their home. They want their kids to stay in school for longer. They want to eat meat or vegetables a little longer during the month. They want those tangible rewards. That's really what they're looking for. And I think part of what we don't realize is that finance is this very nebulous poverty alleviation tool. It's not that easy to really track the impact on people's lives. And I think that that's been frustrating in our journey. And as we look back on some of the learnings that we've had, there's been a number of different attempts to try to connect finance to these broader goals. In fact, there was a UN SGSA paper written by Leora Clapper and others at the World Bank in 2019, which tracked finance to the SDG buckets. And she found that actually finance underpins about 10 of the different SDGs. 
And so in that way, we're, we might be giving ourselves a little bit of a disservice by only thinking about how does finance actually lead to poverty alleviation. That's one SDG and it's incredibly important. But it's incredibly hard to move and you only see the effects of poverty alleviation or even increased resilience over time. So we should be thinking about the impacts of all the things that these gentlemen here on the stage are actually doing with their clients. They are impacting safety and security for their clients. They are impacting light and uh, cleaner energy. They are impacting a number of different factors in people's lives. It's just that we as a community might not be counting them quite as well as we should. So I think in many ways we need to rethink how we create impact in the lives of low-income people. I think that if we think of it more as spreading through their entire lives, then we may actually see that we've done a bit more than we think we have. Thank you. Um, I have, uh, I want to understand this better. You're right, you know, we talk about financial inclusion as a pathway to economic inclusion, but there's this big black box in the middle. So, um, you said, you know, we, we've made certain advances. Can you, can you give us a sense of, well, I have maybe a two-part question, you know. What, what are your thoughts on how far we've come? Can you, can you point out some of the good things that we've done over the last few years? But what are those pieces that we need to sharpen so that we can, we can track impact in that in a better way, in a perhaps more collaborative way, it seems to me, because there's this product and that product, but together there's something happening, something shifting in clients' lives. Mm -hmm. So can you share a little bit on that front? So yeah, I, I, to be honest, I think that we as an industry have done an incredible amount. For me, there's many more, but for me, the two most important impacts that I can see are the range of partners mm -hmm. that we have in the landscape. We're not just talking about working only with banks and MNOs, we're still working with them, but we're talking about a whole range of other partners. And that is tremendous success and it's really changed, I think, how we can use finance to improve people's lives. The other thing is using digital technology to bring price point down and to improve the business case and bring revenues up through cross-sell and more targeted cross-sell. Those things, and we're just getting started on that. So suddenly there's a lot of possibilities in front of us. But I think where we've really missed the mark is understand where, understanding where we're going next. I mean, once we've said, okay, we've, we've really gone a long way in terms of access. I think there's a lot of stumbling around to think, how do we show progress next? A lot of people are talking about usage, but there's a, a few other ideas, I think, that are floating around. Dave Kim, who's in the audience, led some work from the Gates Foundation, and CFI, CFSI, and Dahlberg, talking about financial health and thinking about that as a target. I know the Caribou Digital just came out with a set of work about impact gaps. I think we can actually go a little bit further, and I think a lot of the philanthropic capital underpinning our efforts is actually demanding that we go a bit further. In fact, a year ago at this conference, Mark Flaming, who Zamaya mentioned, um, approached me. He, at the time, was the head of the Pacific Financial Inclusion Program. He's now at, um, at a bank in Myanmar that partners with Wave Money. But Mark said to me, you know, I don't think my program has a problem yet, but I keep getting asked by my donors what impact are you having on people's lives? I know that you're tracking usage and you're tracking your accounts and this is all great, but can you put this impact in a framework that I can understand? And so with the help of UNCDF funding, we went and worked with Mark and Liz Larson and we realized that a fundamental conceptual challenge that we were hitting, when we really started thinking about tracking 
not impact per se, but tracking impact, is that we were conceptualizing the impact of financial tool in terms of you introduce a financial tool and what is the impact on people's lives mostly in the realm of poverty alleviation. We had a one-to-one -one conceptualization of our impact. Now, that's all wrong. That's, that's not what we see in the field. We know that finance is insidious through people's lives. It's like a whole bunch of tentacles that underpin clean water, better energy, um, better health, better well-being. It isn't just a one-to-one -one relationship. We know that in PESA, for example, the best studies that we have on impact in this community is the Surrey Jack work, I would say. So Tavneet Surrey and Billy Jack did a set of experiments on M-Pesa, and they found in a paper that they published in 2005 that M-Pesa prevented a decrease, a 7% decrease in consumption. And then they just last year published a paper that said, well, M-Pesa lifted about 2% of households out of extreme poverty. Now think about this. This is the biggest innovation that we've had in our industry. It's got 100% of, <laughs> of, of access, almost 100% of usage, this super success on both of those measures, and yet here we go and it's 2%. We're preventing a 7% drop. Now I'm not knocking that but it just goes to show you how hard it is to move income. And I think we do ourselves a disservice because if we just imagine those one-to-one -one relationships, it's going to look like a pretty anemic impact, our entire effort. But when we think about it, and PESA doesn't just have one use case, it has a bunch of use cases. And then off of those use cases come a bunch of benefits. And then we know that people have 10 to 20 different financial instruments in their portfolios. So suddenly when we think about all those different webs of impact pathways and we gather them all up, I nearly tripped over one of the wires coming up here. And that's the analogy that I'd like to make. It's like one of those thick wires, if you cut it open, you might see 10 different small wires going to a single impact. Now that looks like what we know is happening with our financial interventions. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to be expensive. I think part of the reason why we've kind of gotten into each other's way is because we think that impact has to equal an RCT. Now, RCTs are awesome when you really need a good answer. But it's not, doesn't mean that we can't track anything else. Finance is this wonderfully rich data set. So we can track pathways to impact. We're doing this with the PFIP portfolio. We'll be tracking their portfolio over the course of a year. It's not expensive. Um, it's a little bit of data science. We've written some code. Um, and their partners are going to run it, and their partners are going to add a couple of questions on their customer satisfaction surveys. Not only is this going to help PFIP see where they get the best bang for their buck, and better explain the story of financial inclusion to their donors, it also helps the financial service providers who can then see where they might be missing the mark on serving their clients, and that is just good business. Thank you, Daryl. So you're, you're pushing this again, and rightfully so, to think about measurement differently and in a bigger way. And not measurement for, for measurement's sake, but really measurement to hold ourselves accountable to these bigger bigger goals that we're, we're signing up towards. And, and I, I, yeah, this message that impact might not have to be an expensive RCT. It could be these um, additional three or four questions in customer satisfaction surveys that financial institutions are already doing with their customers.
Okay, so uh, I wish we could keep on talking, but there are 10 minutes left on the clock, and, and I want to take some questions for the floor. I'm going to ask that the first questions that we get are, are for Microcred and, and for MCOPA, because most of you are providers and might want to know more from Denis and from John. So uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. And, and when you state your question, if you can state your name and the organization you are from, and, and direct, let us know who your question is to. Is it for Denis or is it for John? And, and, and it's okay. If you have a question for Herod and Daryl, we'll take stock of them and maybe we'll get to them later. So, hands. I have a hand here. So get the microphone to Simona. Very interesting presenting two very different business models and uh, they both have the technology underpinning. And, um, but my question to Denis is, um, on this um, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, credit decision being made or taken out of the human um, decision, do you have the data that shows uh, which one has the better accuracy um, between the algorithmic credit decision versus the, the model where you know, um, your officers would make the credit decision? Is that already showing? The answer is, uh, of course, the scoring much better, but uh, I need to explain a little bit further. Because the scoring has the look, in the way we build it, the scoring has the luxury of cherry picking the one he wants, and the other ones are left for a second chance with the human uh, credit decision. So, you know, it, it's like, we can play with this as much as we want. We can say, okay, now let the scoring go a little bit further, and take more people, it will take less risk. At this point, also for the reason of buy-in from our core business, I explained, we want the scoring to be excellent. So what we do is we make sure it's excellent. And that's a, that's a, that's a parameter for us. We can say it's going to accept 3% uh, of the application. In that case, I bet you the, 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 the risk is going to be extremely low. We can say it has to accept 90%. And that in this case, it's going to be lower. So we can play with this parameter. So it's, it's actually much, much higher. But the, the reality is, is what's really important to us is, is not only which one was the best. It's also the end result. The scoring hasn't taken any time from anyone. You know? So even if it gives, if it authorizes some loans that a human being would definitely have said, absolutely not. Even if we have proved that one, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal because we haven't spent much time. So all the other ones will, will pay off for that one. In, in our case also, just to add this, um, in our case also right now, uh, it's important also to recognize that the scoring is actually based on, on, it's actually made possible from the fact that human beings have taken decisions for the last nine years. That is what is helping us to make, to automate that, you know? So it's also taking into account um, our scoring all the, our past that is a result of a negotiation between a portfolio manager and a client. Yeah? You, uh, the client wants that amount, portfolio manager would like this amount too, but he knows that might be too risky, so he lowers it, and the end result is a, is a bargain between the two. And this is what we've observed for nine years, and now we've been able to say, okay, if this has been like this for nine years and people have repaid like that, then we know uh, what decision to take right now. So they are complementary. Uh, my name is Ezekiel Piri. I'm coming from Malawi, Puma Microfinance Limited. Uh, my question goes to, I think it's microcred. Um, if I heard you correctly, you said the the program that you're doing, a person borrows, and it doesn't matter whether they pay early or later, but they pay the same amount. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't that be unfair on those who actually pay you uh, on time and faster? And I wonder how that matches then with um, um, customer protection measures. Thank you. So I think, first of all, I think uh, in there is, paying on time is, is, is three months. It's, you rephrase what I said a little bit differently. You said it doesn't matter if, if you repay late. No, no. If you repay late, it matters. 
but, uh, but, but basically, we, you can also pay early. So, and, and in this case, you are rewarded. If you pay on time, you are not punished. It's only if you pay late that you are punished, and now punished in the sense that now your amount to repay is increasing. So we are, we are going to, we're basically talking about from zero days to three months. After three months, you are late, so it's another story. But we, from zero days to three months, it's just everybody's on time. Some, now to your point, is it unfair? The client chooses what he wants to do. We are not threatening him, again, it's important. We are not threatening him with anything that would look like a punishment if he doesn't repay early. We are giving him additional benefits if he, if he repays early. And some of them, are paying after three months, and that's fine. And we say, okay, fine, absolutely okay. To those who repay within two weeks, obviously, we say that's great. Um, you know? And so it's a, it's a, so the, the the qualitative feedback is this is exactly what we want, and it's cheap. And if if I may, just a, 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 a few more seconds. The thing is really that. If you lend today to someone, my, my view of the, the usual loans we do, and we do a lot of them, so I'm not saying those are bad loans, but uh, um, it's, 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 it's costly for the client to take the loan. It's costly for the transaction. It takes time, it's cumbersome, they don't like it the way we do, they don't always like it. You have, we visit their home, their business, we ask uh, collaterals, all of that. So because it's a bit heavy, they won't take a small amount. They say for a small amount, it, it's, it's, not, it's not interesting. So they want a big amount. If they want a big amount, we say, okay, fine, we want a big term because we don't think you can pay that much every month. So now we are in this discussion back to, okay, it's going to be for one year, and now we're pushing the client in a situation where we ask him to know that in 12 months from now, he's going to be able to repay us 50000 whatever the currency, you know? And that's very difficult. How do I know that in 12 months from now I'll be able to pay 50,000 in, in, my, in, my, in, my eco, in my informal ecosystem? It's very difficult to project that. Now, if we, sh if we now make the, the, the transaction cost of loan disbursement so low that the client says, oh, but if it just takes me to go to the agent and take it and that's it, I'm finding much smaller amounts. And if, I, if, if I'm finding taking much smaller amounts, it means I can, I can cover everything into short time, and short time I know. I know much more what is going to be my situation in six weeks or two months than I know for 12 months. So I think also this is one of the reasons for which our clients like this product most, is that they are now able to, to borrow for working capital much, and they consider they reduce the risk for themselves of uncertainty of what their business is gonna, is gonna be like. So, so I don't think, um, so I think client protection, unfair, it, it would not apply to the product if, it's, if you hear our clients at least. Thank you. Thank you, Denis. Um, I'm, I'm seeing a couple more hands, but unfortunately we're going to have to start wrapping up. Uh, we, we have to move on to our next session. But uh, instead of doing the closing myself, I thought I would just uh, give it back to the panelists again. I have one sort of lightning round uh, style. I have one question for all of you, and you have 30 seconds to answer this. I'll start with um, the same question, but we'll start uh, from hearing from Denis, John, Herod, and then Daryl. So the question is, when you think about your business model, when you reflect on your business model, and in the case of Herod and Daryl, what the business models that you know of, you know, what do you think are those one or two key leverage points that will enable us and you to continue to advance and push the frontier on financial inclusion? I go. Um, I've been long on the answer, so I'm going to go very fast. One, um, I mentioned it already, moving the client from a transactional-based uh, relationship into a solution-based relationship. He thinks mm -hmm. about us anytime he has a need around, around liquidity, basically. Thank you. John? Yeah, so we have a detailed understanding of our customers in respect of certain needs, but it, I think it's all about getting much more granular understanding of the other needs that they have of their household. Some of that is face-to-face -face <clears throat> and collaboration with organizations, <clears throat> excuse me, doing household surveys, and some of it can be technology, but really understanding across the massive 
based on customers we have the, the discrete detailed needs is the, is the key for them. Okay. I'll do a quote. Um, in a world where low income customers make little use of financial services, and I'm speaking about formal financial services, providing value is the missing piece of the puzzle to growing the business. For me, that's that providing value part. Mm -hmm. That is the, and, and this is the magic of what Daryl also yes. sort of saying that that's the tip of the iceberg, sort of trying to work out how you provide value. What is value? That's the challenge. Okay. And I'm just going to answer in a very business model-y way, <laughs> actually, but I really think it, it, right now it's all about enhancing what you know about the customer. Every little snippet of data to try to cross sell. It costs so much to acquire customers that if you can suit as many of their needs in as effective a way as you can, then I think that that's the lever point, especially with the technology innovations that we have today and the, the machine learning, et cetera, that we've been able to develop. Thank you. So this side of the panel, emphasizing insights and really just continuing <laughs> to understand customers, this side of my panel, solutions and value. But it's, it's really all just one conversation. So please, please jo uh, you know, join me in thanking my panelists, Herat, Denis, John, and Daryl for this first plenary session. <laughs>